it is uh, it is my time to once again uh, recognize our sponsors. Let me put up our slide deck here of our sponsors because without them, as I've said multiple times throughout the day, without uh, our sponsors on board, none of this would have been possible today. Uh, so I want to take a few minutes to acknowledge uh, our sponsors at, at our various levels. Uh, at the diamond level, Warner Media. Uh, at the gold level, uh, my home college, the Kennesaw State University, Michael J. Coles College of Business, along with my home department, the Coles College Department of Information Systems. Uh, in addition to them, uh, we have Bishop Fox, uh, Coal Fire, Genuine Parts Company, and NCR, and we are very thankful for, for all of their support at the gold level. Uh, at the crystal level, we have uh, Critical Path Security and Synopsis, and we are very grateful for their sponsorship at the, at the crystal level. Uh, at the silver level, a few sponsors here. We've got, uh, i got to read them off the list. I'm getting tired, sorry. Aaron's, uh, Binary Defense, uh, Black Hills Information Security, Corelight, and GuidePoint uh, Security, and we are very thankful for their sponsorship uh, at the silver level. At the bronze level, the NCC group, thank you very much for your sponsorship at that level. Also want to acknowledge some in-kind sponsors, We've got a couple of them. EC Council uh, provided a great training opportunity yesterday that some of you took advantage of. And also we want to thank uh, and acknowledge uh, Secure Code Warriors, or Secure Code Warriors, sorry. They have been running a, a coding CTF all day long in a separate track, and I've been kind of keeping an eye on that a little bit. Uh, and they've been banging away at that stuff all day long, and it looks like it's uh, nip and tuck as to who's going to end up taking the top three places where they've got some type of prizes over there. I'm not sure uh, exactly what they are, but they're giving some prizes away there. Uh, next, want to thank some individuals and organizations for contributing to our uh, our uh, giveaway uh process that we've been going through most of the day that Joette has been doing a wonderful job of over there in the uh, giveaway channel. I uh, want to acknowledge Mike Costa and Crosshair Information Technology. I uh, want to acknowledge Joe Gray. We also want to acknowledge uh, Offensive Security uh, as well as uh, the Pentester Lab for all of the things that they've uh, contributed to us to be able to give away to you at uh, various points in time throughout the day. Uh, this is a virtual global conference for the first time ever, and as a result, we are curious about where you are, and so I'm going to stop sharing that for a minute. Uh, and so if you haven't done so already, uh, please go drop a pin in the map that you can find at the URL that I'm about to place here uh, in the channel. Uh, because we want to know where you are. We want to know where you're coming from and, and, and uh, what part of the world uh, you're, you're hanging out in lately. So if you, if you wouldn't mind, drop a pin there and let us know uh, where you are. Uh, also, uh, I mentioned previously, uh, we've been giving away things all afternoon. Joette has been handling that over in this channel. And I'm going to put that in here. And just to remind you again that uh, keep an eye on that. There is a sign-up form that you need to put your information in on to, to be eligible to win. And for those of you who are privacy uh, concerned, I get it. But if you want to get stuff sent to you, we need to know who you are and how to get a hold of you. So uh, we need you to punch in real information, real mailing address, real email address, and a real cell phone number uh, for, for any of that uh, to happen. Uh, also, uh, we've been having people ask us all day long, hey, I missed a talk. Uh, where can I find it? Well, we're recording all of them, and we have a professional post-production process in place. And once those videos, uh, those talks have been run through uh, post-production, uh, we're going to make them available in our YouTube channel. And so people have been asking, where's the YouTube channel? Well, it's right here for you. I'm posting it. Uh, in the channel. Uh, we're asking that everybody go out and subscribe to that because I found out a few minutes ago that once we hit 100 subscribers, we get to have a fancy vanity URL. So the closer you can help us get to 100, uh, the, the better off we are and, and we appreciate that. 
Um, let's see here. Um, I think that that's about all I've got. So I'm going to stop yapping, grab my piece of paper, and introduce our next two speakers. Uh, we have with us Jeremy Brooks and Stuart Lane, uh, and they will be talking with us uh, about automated web application and API discovery and other things that sound simple but are actually difficult. And with that, I will turn it over to those two nice gentlemen, and I will stop talking. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for spending some time hanging out with us. Um, my name is Jeremy Brooks. Um, I'm a developer for the last 20 years that uh, sort of switched over to, to AppSec um, and focused on AppSec for probably the last five plus years working on different things. Now I'm running a uh, application security program at a Fortune 1000 retailer. Um, here today with a co-worker of mine, Stuart. Let him do his Hi, own. Yep, I'm Stuart Lane. Um, I'm an application security engineer. Uh, I work with Jeremy. I'm also a student at Kennesaw State University, majoring in information security and insurance and graduating this May. So let's uh, get right go into Wells. it. Yeah, go Wells. <laughs> so we'll get right into it. Um, so the challenge that we're presenting is to find and scan every application and API in your organization. Uh, NIST has developed the five functions, which constitutes a, a strong cybersecurity program. And a lot of people focus on the protect part, but you can only protect your applications if you know where they are. So we focused our efforts on identify uh, which enables us to understand what type of risk is possible within a specific environment in our organization. Basically, if you don't know about it, you can't assign a risk to it. So we're not going to talk about how to set up DAST and SAST. Um, that's for another talk. We're specifically talking about before you go into that stuff, how do you find those applications? And the challenge with this is that AppSec teams don't have a great discovery process or it's a it's a passive process. Uh, there, are new, there are new apps and legacy web apps that maybe no one knows about. Uh, and M API endpoints, they propose a completely different challenge because they're difficult to find in general. It's like, go find all your web apps. Well, okay, but how are we gonna do that? And that's where teams usually fall back into an old school onboarding model. Um, so here's what a typical old onboarding process looks like that an AppSec team may, have, may set up. Uh, this is a prime example of what a waterfall method is, and dev teams just don't do waterfall anymore. If you try to implement this in an agile development model, it would be perceived as a gate, and developers won't follow it uh, and figure out a way to bypass this process, leaving you wondering why no one is filling out the form that you created. And even if you can get a dev team to do this, the data given to you only works really if it's new development. Um, and that information is also becomes out of date as soon as it's handed off to you. So our approach, um, basically how do you, you, you know, you still wanna be involved with the dev teams. You wanna know what they're working on and security is still important even in an agile development process. It just requires a mind shift and an understanding of how new software flows um, on the dev development teams and you have to have some idea on how to hook into those different points in, into the pipeline. So we're going from a passive to an active search for applications and then based off the inventory that's built, we identify risk factors um, and that's specific to our organization that we're gonna talk about um, later on. And uh, based off of the risk factors in the inventory, we track changes and we create alerts based off of those changes. Yep, that's great. So be before we dive into the methodology, we'll kind of give you our thought process as we were um, building this, this process out and how we sort of thought about how we're going to tackle this problem. And basically, we went back to the SDLC and we thought about you know, what, what does it look like in the environment when new, when software is being built um, and being tested and being deployed, what, what's going on, what kind of activity? So there's repositories being created, there's commits 
flow into repositories. Um, if it's, you know, if they're actually doing agile or lean, you know, there should be a CI CD pipeline. So there should be projects being created. Um, there should be DNS entries for these web apps, right? I mean, they, they're going to have names um, and URLs that people can visit. Um, so there should be DNS records. There should be infrastructure being set up. And if they have a proper pipeline, they're probably going to have a dev environment, a QA testing environment, and then a production environment. So our thought process was we should go look for signs of life. You know, we should go look for, at sources of truth to figure out where the software is. And that's kind of the foundational thought behind our, um, behind our pipeline. So this is what our pipeline actually looks like at a very high level. Um, we're looking at, we're doing DNS enumeration. So we're collecting lots of host names that may be running web applications, may not. We're doing web host discovery on those. Um, we're doing API discovery, which is basically going a little bit further. It's web host discovery is kind of just checking to see if there's something at common web ports and it, does it look webby, right? Does it speak HTTP? API discovery is looking for REST APIs. Um, then we're doing risk factor identification. And what we're trying to determine there is do we really care about this application beyond just knowing that it exists. Um, you know, we're not going to necessarily scan everything or do full penetration tests. We, we need to look and make a determination on how deep do we need to go. And then we're generating alerts on all this stuff. So we're not having to manually go and constantly look for these things. We're getting feedback from the system. So look at each piece of this. Um, the DNS enumeration, it's pretty basic, but we're looking at sources of truth, right? So um, the, the first place to look is to look at your DNS servers and look at the zones. So we have a system that is trusted by the master DNS server and it can do zone transfers. And that gets us a lot of records back. And we're specifically looking at A records, quad A records and C names and using those to build fully qualified domain names. Um, if you're using Azure DNS or AWS's uh, Route 53, you can enumerate DNS through their REST APIs. Um, we're actually using Azure DNS, so we just go through all the zones using the, um, the Azure DNS uh, zone API, and then we pull all the records and we look for those A records and C name records. Um, so that gets us the big bulk of, of uh, the host names. In addition to that, we also run some, exter some tools that look at external uh, data sources. So a mask and find domain are the two specific tools we use. Um, all the tools I'm gonna talk about, by the way, are open source. Um, these tools give us a view of shadow IT. Um, so I don't know if you saw uh, the Bishop Fox presentation, they kind of touched on this and, and we're doing something kind of similar um, because you might have found all your DNS records, but there could be some application out there or some app that somebody stood up um, that's still linked to your domain. And this is a good, these two tools are a great way to, to find out where those are and add them to your inventory. So once we've built that list, um, at this point, all we have are host names. We don't know what's running on those. We need, we're really interested in web applications. So we need to go look for the ones that, that look webby. Um, so you could use Nmap or curl or roll your own thing that goes out and hits various ports. Um, I came across a tool called HTT probe, which is a, a little go program. It's uh, it's pretty fast and it, really gets the job done. So it's very nice. You just feed it a list of host names and it spits out a list of web hosts with the port and scheme attached. Perfect. That's exactly what we need. Um, the other thing that you can do, so if you're not having good luck with, um, with doing uh, like the 
convincing your sysadmins to allow your uh, server to, to do zone transfers or you're not figuring out where to get the, you know, you're not getting access to your um, cloud-based DNS system. Um, look at your continuous deployment tools because those have to push that application out somewhere. And so in the configuration, there's going to be a host name of where that application lives. Um, so that could be a good place to do. We're not at the point of where we feel like we need to do that data mining, but it's another place to look. So at this point, now we've kind of whittled it down to, we've got a big list of web hosts where we suspect web applications are running. Um, we would also like to know within those applications, where are our APIs? Um, so most developers, if they're building new APIs, they're probably not using SOAP. Um, SOAP was kind of cool back in the day because you could trust that there would be a WSDL endpoint, which pretty much described every, um, every endpoint for the API. So you were, once you found the WSDL, you're kind of done. Um, REST is a little more complicated because it's, it's kind of wild, wild west. Uh, there is a new, relatively new, it's been out for a few years now, but um, fairly widely adopted, let's just call it the de facto standard for REST APIs. Um, it started life as Swagger. Some people still call it Swagger. It was rebranded a couple years ago as Open API, but you'll still use, see those terms kind of intermixed. If you're not familiar with it, you can go check out the swagger.io site, but it's basically a way to um, describe your REST API in a machine readable way. So it'll be either a JSON object or a YAML object. And that's what we're looking for. Um, so our strategy is to take the list of web hosts that we found and go visit some of the common endpoints where we know our developers push out APIs. And we look for a, a JSON or YAML document on the other end of that. Um, that's, that's a pretty good way to do it. It's not bulletproof, but if somebody has a better way, I'd like to hear it. But that works well in our environment because we know something. So you have to know a little bit about how your developers build their APIs. Um, you might have a different list of common locations. Um, and one point I don't think we made clear is none of this uh, changes your relationship with the developers, by the way. You still need to have good communication. But this lets you go out and, and fish instead of sitting by and waiting for developers to come to you. Um, another good place to look if you're using uh, Azure's API management services or AWS API gateway, again, you can just go data mine that and you can just enumerate all of the APIs. And when developers configure their APIs through either of these tools, through Azure or AWS, you basically get the open API doc for free. You just need to go and find all the um, find all the resources and go visit the endpoint that gives you the open API doc. Um, and the other cool thing about Swagger or open API is um, a lot of tools support it. So Postman, you can just drop an open API doc into Postman and it generates a test suite for you. Um, Burp, there's a plugin for Burp, there's a plugin for Zap. A lot of commercial scanners have built-in support where you can just feed them a document. All right, and then finally, risk factor identification. Um, so these are the high level risk factors we're looking for. Um, these kind of give us a, a quick view of how deep we want to go. Um, again, you might have different risk factors, but these are the ones that we kind of agreed on internally that are signals of um, that we need to go deeper. So is it a login page? Is it using is it configured to use weak TLS, which I understand that's not an application issue, but we found that applications that are running on a server configured with weak TLS tend to have other problems. So it's a signal for us. Um, if it supports HTTP with a, with, and it doesn't redirect to HTTPS. So in other words, I can visit HTTP uh, website, HTTPS website, and basically get the same content that's a signal that there's, a, that there's some risk there. Outdated or old sites, again, with this enumeration, we're probably gonna find some legacy stuff that's not part of the pipeline 
that nobody's looking at. Um, so we want to be able to identify those kind of legacy older sites. Um, and then a risky keywords. So that's what that's about is going into the uh, looking at the response or looking at um, your Git repositories and looking for um, words that you might be specific to your environment. So for our environment, we're really concerned with applications that touch payments or applications that deal with sensitive PII. So we're looking for applications that have um, keywords that seem to indicate that they're doing this. And then the last one, which we haven't fully cracked yet, although I'm super interested to look deeper into the smog cloud, um, which uh, Bishop Fox talked about this morning, is, is it an external versus internal? We sort of intuit it based on where we discovered it. If we find it through like a mass or find domain, um, we kind of put it in the external bucket. If we find it through one of our internal DNS servers, we put it in internal. That's not always correct though, because we have some things that are internal that still somehow leak external, but it's still a pretty good, um, a, a pretty good indicator. So kind of touched on this stuff, but um, eyeballer is, is good for finding login pages or old looking sites. So this is a, a Bishop Fox tool that they published back in the fall. Um, really easy to use. Just take, just use Chrome headless, feed it your lit, your, uh, your list of web hosts, generate the screenshots, feed it an eyeballer, and then let eyeballer do the classification for you. So they've got like four different classifiers. Um, right now we're just looking at login pages and old looking sites. Um, if you're familiar with SSL labs, which is hosted by Qualys, um, you might like to look at test SSL.sh. It's a open source free version of that that you can run on your own host. So you don't have to worry about, um, you know, getting API throttled or uh, you can you can tune it. It really is a Swiss army knife of TLS checks. Um, we kind of, we do the, the fast version that just looks for critical issues and um, report those as risk factors. Um, and repository activity. So I was talking about risky keywords. Um, that's where we're looking for those. Um, new repositories, we actually alert on that because if somebody creates a new repository, usually the name of the repository has a good clue of what it does. And if nothing else, it's a chance to go engage with the developers and say, hey, we noticed you created a new repo called um, do su super sensitive thing with customer data. Um, let's talk about it. And you can also, if, if you're using an on-prem version, you can use a tool like Talisman or Get Secrets and look for hard-coded secrets. We're not there yet. We're using Bitbucket Cloud, which doesn't have hooks. So we're actually trying to build something um, that basically monitors for changes. So we can't do the blocking, but we can do the reporting. But if you've got an on-prem solution for repositories, you could use one of these. So that's that's our full pipeline. I see the questions piling up in Slack, so I'll, I'll get to those in just a second. Um, what I wanted to talk to you about a little bit was uh, outcomes. Um, so we, we've been able to successfully implement um, a lot of this pipeline. And so we've, we've moved past the passive discovery. Now we go out and find stuff. We still have developers come to us. We still have open lines of communication, but we're just as likely to find something new that, that they haven't told us about as, as we are to, to have them come by. Um, so it gives us a chance to start the conversation. Um, the really big benefit of this is we have a basically a continuously up-to-date application inventory. Um, we can have, you know, we're just constantly building that. So this thing runs all the time. It basically runs and when it's done, it just starts up again. So it's, it just never ends. Um, we're able to use those identifiers that I pointed out as, as risk factors. So we attach that to the, the finding and we can say, it, it kind of gives us a quick um, hint on, on whether we need to go deeper into the site. Um, and we're sending all these alerts to a Slack channel that we monitor and that our developers can monitor too. So we're getting good visibility on all these things. And 
I'll give you a little teaser. Um, so we built this out with some of those open source tools that I talked about, but we also wrote some proprietary code and because this is something that, you know, we built um, for our team at work. It's, it's proprietary to our employer. So I can't just post this stuff up uh, to GitHub and say, have at it. Um, but I'll show you real quick how we built it and I'll give you some better news right after this. Um, so this is just an example of one of the Slack alerts. So here we, you know, two new APIs discovered in Azure, um, two new live web hosts were discovered and some new Bitbucket repositories. Um, and we can go look at each one of those and see, you know, what the, what they look like, what the risk factors were. Um, we built it out as a REST API. So um, we have our own little swagger page uh, and we have just a, cron job basically that just runs it on repeat. Um, so like I said, the bad news is I can't just take this and post it, but what I'm doing right now is I'm gonna build out and it just started, like this is literally fresh um, as of this week and I published it up to my GitHub. So there is a AppSec discovery um, repo in my GitHub and you're welcome to go check it out. Like I said, it's really raw um, but I do have, I have implemented some uh, a significant part of the pipeline and you can, if nothing else, use it as a example of how to use some of those tools, but I'm going to continue building it out. It'd be awesome if you want to collaborate on it. Um, totally down with that. Um, if you just want to pull it down and maybe try to use it to bootstrap something in your organization, that'd be awesome too. Um, but that wraps it up. Stuart, did you have anything else? I kind of blasted. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, you know, back to risk factor identification, yeah. like the the goal, you know, is to is to decide if the site's work, worth taking a deeper look at, right? So in our organization, we have over 2,000 applications. So based on our risk factors, we might not, we might engage and we might not, but it's good to know. It's good to know that these applications exist in general. So, I mean, that's really what we're looking at there but yeah. I, no that was great i think that um it was it was good jeremy good all if right anybody has any questions we can start answering. yeah there's some good questions so all right so here's one it says how would you do api discovery in an environment where documentation is outdated or not even done at all so yeah i mean that th this is a good model for that it, really what you need to do is look for patterns so even if you don't know where everything is is if you know where some stuff is um you probably have a pattern that you could follow so if your developers aren't sticking their apis under you know a slash api endpoint they're probably doing something similar if nothing else you can start looking through source code repositories and look for those patterns and then build those out into your automation unfortunately there's not you know, there's no magic. I mean, APIs are, are tough and it's just mm -hmm. because they're not, well, especially REST APIs because discoverability is very tricky with them. There's, there's, there's nothing to crawl, right? It's not like a standard website where you point it at the root page and you get back links and forms and stuff that you can then start crawling. Um, if you go visit the root page of an API, you're just as likely to get a blank page as to anything else. Um, but if they're using some standards like um, Swagger or Open API, you can look for those Swagger docs or Open API docs and use that as your um, uh, documentation. Um, if and then you said for web host discovery, would you recommend a network perimeter scan for applications communicating through firewalls, B two B or B two C? Yeah, that would be a cool. Uh, that would actually be a really cool feature. So I think you're talking about like um, looking at your firewall logs and seeing. Uh, Basically, you want, you want to build your own CASB kind of thing, right? Um, you could do that. I think you'd have to figure out, you know, if you're using, it's going to depend on what kind of firewall you're using. But, you know, like Palos, I know they have uh, logs and you can um, pull those out. If, if As long as it's like an enterprise firewall, there's probably an API and there's probably logs that you can pull out and, um, and data mine those for, uh, for B2B and B2C communication. Um, Okay, cool. So it looks like we're getting the hook. Uh, yeah, um, I'll answer the rest of the questions in the Slack channel. Thanks, guys. I will yeah, post the slides and uh, 
thanks for your attention. Have a great rest of the conference. Yep, thanks, guys.